Hello, and welcome to Folklore Facts, The Bell Witch. Today we are getting into the spirit of the season with looking at a fairly odd ghost story in our revival of my Folklore Facts series. While my main goal in this video is to present the story, I would like to also delve into the lore and see if we can figure out what exactly was happening here, if anything at all. The story diverges depending on who is telling it, but I will try to make a note of this when it does occur. This topic was suggested to me by a viewer by the name of Deb Rose, the Tennessee Scary Lady. As a note, I kept getting this strange feeling that I've already talked about this topic before, but after searching my video catalog, I couldn't see where I had. If, by chance, I have made something about this, please forgive me since I couldn't find it. Also, if you are curious, the new intro is only for Halloween. I made one for this month and for December. My old one will return next month. So turn down the lights, get a warm drink, and settle in for the spooky story of the Bell Witch. The story of the Tennessee Bell Witch begins in the 1800s in an area known as Red River, which is now known as Adams, Tennessee. This is the area where North Carolina native John Bell, his wife Lucy, and their six children set up their home. John built a large house on some land he had bought, and over the following years had extended his property to an impressive 328 acres of land, which a majority of it was cleared in order to be used for farming crops. In 1817, John was tending to his fields when he was shocked by the sight of a strange looking dog. The dog was large, completely black, and oddly enough was described as having a head of a rabbit. Not knowing what it was, or if it was dangerous, John fired a couple shots at the creature, to which it ran away and vanished from sight. That same night, while the family were eating their supper, they heard the sound of something pounding on the side of the house. John and his boys run outside to apprehend the culprit, but found nothing to be there. This sound continued for quite some time, and it always happened at night, but who was doing it couldn't be determined. Later, John's son, Drew, was working in the fields when he noticed a strange, extraordinarily large big black bird sitting on a fence post, just appearing to watch him work. Elizabeth, known simply as Betsy, was the Bell's only daughter, and she said that she started seeing a strange girl in a green dress swinging from an oak tree on their property. Not to break the mood here, but I am going to assume she meant using a swing and not by a noose. Although, with this story, you never know. Anyway, back to the story. Members of the household frequently mentioned that they saw a large black dog follow them around when they were outside at night. After these sightings, the odd activity started to pick up inside the family's house as well, with a main focus on the children. They would say that they would be awoke to the sound of gnawing at their bedposts, which sounded like rats, yet no damage could be found. This then led to the children's covers being pulled off of them and their pillows thrown off of the bed by some invisible being. Yet again the activity intensified, with the children stating something would pull their hair, scratch them, and in an odd common occurrence with this story, they would say they would get slapped by this presence, which would leave welts and handprints on the skin. Betsy seemed to be the biggest target, since most afflictions were aimed at her, and she claimed she would sometimes feel like pins were being put into her. It is also worth mentioning that the knocking sounds on the walls had moved to the doors as well, and also the sound of dogs fighting and chains dragging on the floor were heard as well. It is also during this time that John started to experience a strange paralysis in his mouth from time to time, as well as twitching and difficulty swallowing. While this was happening, the family could hear the sound of an old woman faintly whispering, or what almost sounded like singing hymns. At first, the family decided to keep the activity to themselves, but as it kept growing more intense, they invited a family friend over named James Johnston to see if he could help them. That night, James and his wife stayed over at the Bell House and started to encounter the same presence that the family had been describing. After being attacked while they slept, James jumped out of bed and said, In the name of the Lord, who are you and what do you want? Suddenly, a disembodied voice replied, I am a spirit. I was once very happy, but now have been disturbed. It is at this point that many claim the spirit conveys that it came about due to a Native American burial ground on the property being disturbed, and this led John's son Drew in a fruitless search for buried treasure. 
Some say she gave her name as old Kate Bass, and yet others say James never heard a response when he sprung from bed to confront the entity. Over time, the spirit gained the ability to speak quite loudly and would frequently use this to taunt the family, singing hymns, or even providing gossip from the family's neighbors. At one point, it is said that this being actually recited two separate sermons word for word from churches 13 miles apart on the same day at the same time they were being preached. This obviously shows the spirit wasn't afraid of religious objects or topics. In saying that, while the ghost did enjoy tormenting the household, it often seemed to act like a normal house guest, where it would talk to certain family members about life, religious discussions, and other topics. The spirit was said to actually like John's wife Lucy and would bring her fresh fruit and sing to her. However, she nicknamed John Old Jack and frequently stated that she intended to kill him. Some even claimed that the ghost even foretold in great detail the events of the Civil War, which wouldn't take place for another 40-some years. Now here is the part of the story that many find questionable. It is said that at that time, General Andrew Jackson was told about the activities at the household by John's sons, John Jr., Drury, and Jesse, who all served under Andrew during the Battle of New Orleans. In 1817, he decided to take a few of his men to the property to check out the activity. It is said that while traveling down the lane, the wagon was suddenly stuck, unable to move by some unseen force. No matter what they tried, they couldn't break free of the restraints before them. Suddenly a disembodied female voice spoke and stated she would allow them to continue, but she would be seeing them later that evening. During the visit, things were relatively quiet, although Jackson's men were notably on edge. At one point, one of his followers, who claimed to be a witch tamer, pulled out a pistol and stated it had silver bullets inside and would kill any spirit and that was why the ghost was afraid to show itself. Suddenly the man lurched up, claiming to be stuck with pins and feeling as if he was being slapped, and then was kicked in the butt by the spirit shoving him to the door. The spirit then stated that by the end of the night, another man in Jackson's party would be exposed as a fraud. The men were terrified of this, but Jackson stayed resolute and wanted to wait and see who the fraud was. Not much is said about what happened after this, but there are reports that General Jackson and his men left the house in the morning, bound for Nashville. Later on, Betsy became infatuated with a local boy named Joshua Gardner, who, the two, it was said, would eventually become engaged. However, the Bell Ghost wasn't as thrilled about the union. The spirit directly told Betsy that she didn't want her to marry Joshua, and when those wishes were ignored, it took to antagonizing the pair no matter where they went. Finally, after constant torment, it is said that Betsy broke off the engagement in April of 1821. Between all of this and 1820, John Bell started to succumb to his previously mentioned afflictions and became bedridden. The spirit continued to antagonize him by pulling off his shoes when he tried to walk, slapping him, causing him seizures, and chastising him in a voice that was so loud that the whole farm could hear it. Finally, on December 20th, 1820, John fell into a coma and died. Upon inspection, the gathering family found a small vial of fluid in a cupboard, and when John Jr. gave it to the cat, it immediately died. The spirit then spoke up and said that she had given old Jack a good dose of that last night. During John's funeral, the ghost showed up and started singing the drinking song called Row Me Up Some Brandy O, and didn't stop until the last person left the gravesite. On a side note, I looked this song up, and the closest one I could find is called Row Me Up Some Whiskey O. It is a song about someone killing someone else and waiting for them to return, but at the same time, almost taunting them. I would include a sample here, but I don't want this video claimed. I will provide a link to it in the description so you can listen to it, and since the video has no comments, I would appreciate it if you would show it some cryptid family love. Anyway, back to the story. After Betsy broke up with her lover, the following year the spirit visited Lucy and told her she was going away for a while but would return in seven years. It returned in 1828 and did start tormenting the family again, but it also took to having conversations with the children in the household about various topics. For the most part, the family took to ignoring this specter, and after three weeks it stated it was leaving again and would return in 107 years to the descendants of John Bell. 
Even though there were a few that were still alive at that point in time, no records exist if the spirit actually kept its word. Now this story wouldn't be complete if I didn't at least mention that near the Bell House is a cave conveniently named the Bell Witch Cave. The cave is about 490 feet long and it is said to be the actual home of the spirit. When the Bells still lived in the area, the children would play in the cave and it is said that at one point one of the boys got stuck and was pulled out by the ankles by an invisible force. In an odd turn of events, the ghost then is said to have given the children a lecture about not exploring the caves. Since that time, there have been many reported sightings of strange shadows, odd noises, and eerie feelings while being around the cave. One report even occurred in 1977 when five soldiers from Fort Campbell decided to make a trip to the cave to investigate. During the night, one of the soldiers stated that he didn't believe in the ghost stories and then immediately felt some invisible force grab him around the chest. Now true to the title of this video, I have given you the folklore and now I'd like to go over a couple facts. Or should I say points? As odd as this may sound, a strange situation happened in the area of Adams not long after this story of the haunting made its way around town. There were at least three cases, with one ending in murder, where a person claimed to be possessed by the Bell Witch. In many statements, the person began to act strangely or become erratic. From what I found, the person who claimed to be possessed was killed, and oddly enough, the culprits were ruled not guilty. Now, the most obvious question many of you may have is why the ghost is referred to as a witch when all activities seem to be something else. That is a good question, since originally the events were known as the Tennessee Ghost or simply Bell Ghost, with no mention of witch. Martin Van Buren Ingram published his well-known book entitled An Authenticated History of the Famous Bell Witch in 1894, and much of the stories we have today come from his works. Other information is gathered from a book written by Charles Bailey Bell, who is obviously a descendant of the family. Many view Martin with a skeptical eye on his accounts, but to his credit, he did visit the area of Adams in 1825 and made a point to interview as many people as possible about the story. I personally have no opinion about him either way, but there are both camps of those who hate him and those who love him. Anyway, in Martin's retelling, he mentioned that the spirit once referred to itself as Old Kate Bat's Witch, and that is where the story stuck. Outside of that, there isn't any other references to the presence being a witch. The story also splits where the origins of the story has multiple avenues. Some retellings simply don't give an explanation, while others mention the burial mound I discussed earlier. In another version, there is claims that John Bell killed an overseer before the family left North Carolina, and it was the ghost of that murdered man. Not many people include this part of the tale, so I doubt it is accurate. However, it would give a good reason for the family to leave North Carolina, and why the ghost was so angry with John. The burial ground theory is quite interesting, since I could see that being plausible. During that time, not many people cared about respecting the hallowed grounds of buried Native Americans, so I can only assume that with 328 acres of land being cleared by John, he could have destroyed a mound as well. Many haunting has been said to be linked to disturbing burial mounds. In talking about John, after reading about his afflictions, I have to wonder if he wasn't suffering from Bell's palsy or maybe even a stroke. His symptoms certainly seemed to fit and the maladies weren't widely known. If you're curious, Bell's palsy was named after a Scottish surgeon named Sir Charles Bell from the UK. Granted, some spirit activity has been known to cause physical ailments, so I can't be sure. The Andrew Jackson part of the story is debated as well. Some say that detailed records of Jackson's travels never show him visiting the Bell house. Yet there are a few reports from the Bell children themselves who claim Andrew did visit. So again, who's to say? I do have a problem with the witch tamer part of the story. At that time, an ounce of silver cost around $1.30, and also, that amount is equivalent to around $25 today. Even if the pistol that was shown used a ball, it still would be around $1.30 per shot, or $25 today, since most agree they weighed slightly under a full ounce. I don't know many gun enthusiasts today who would pay $25 for one bullet. There are a few, but not many. That was one pretty rich soldier in my book. So my final question is, what was the Bell Ghost? 
No one can be sure, but the activity is really odd, even for a normal ghost haunting. The changing into animals, the physical activity, and the act of being very talkative with the family, all tied together, seem very peculiar. There have been minute cases of this reported before, such as one I remember coming from England not so long ago, so it is possible to happen. However, one link is always present in most all of the stories, and that is Betsy. Some have accused her of faking everything, including a claim that she learned how to become a ventriloquist. In some reports, I saw that the locals viewed her as the culprit to all activity. This would make quite a bit of sense if you were to assume that the animals seen were just random normal animals. It is also possible that Betsy could have caused the activity unknowingly, much like what most people think poltergeist activity comes from. Maybe she had some hatred towards her father and it manifested, which comes into play when figuring her mother was largely untouched as well as her oldest brother. It also begs the question about the vial of unknown poison found. I have heard a lot of ghost encounters, but I haven't found one yet that will mix up a potion, bottle it up, and put it into the cupboard. I think something else might have been going on there. However, I'll let you make that decision. I really hope that you enjoyed this video since it took a lot of time to put together. I tried to include as much information as I could, but of course I couldn't include it all. Sadly, due to the length of this topic, I am unable to include my three comments section. I actually had it all written out and didn't think that there would be much of an issue, but I had no clue how much information there was to the story, so I promised to get to them next time. If you haven't yet done so, do please consider subscribing to my channel for content similar to this, and also, could you share my videos with someone you know who may be interested in this type of genre. With that, be safe, and I'll see you in the next one. Later!